So the fun thing about this, this panel, um, apart from the fact that everybody is early career, the extra fun thing about it is that we deliberately filled the panel at the very, very last minute. Um, and it's about giving people opportunities rather than just looking for people who are well known in the community and putting them on a panel or looking for people who just happen to be in my network and putting them on a panel. This is why we deliberately left it during the event. So we have, they've chosen where to sit themselves, but they've so happened that these three here had some advance warning of the questions that were picked early. And the two over on my left hand side were picked during the last hour um, or in general the last <laughs> half an hour. Um, and so I've got, um, they have seen the questions, but They've had no time to think about it, whereas these team here have had a few days to think about it. Um, so in some cases, this is their very first panel. I think um, at least three of the panel members, it's their very first panel. Um, so go easy on them as an audience from that point of view, and I'll do my best as a moderator to go easy on them. I can sometimes be a little bit strict as a moderator, but I'll do my best. Um, hold on. Hold on. Um, Jan's still working with the backdrop. Okay, yeah. so while, while Jan's doing that, we're going we're gonna to start a little bit. So we're going to do some very quick introductions while names are going up on the screen. So we're going to go just along the line. I'm going to ask each person to tell um, the, the, the audience their name, how long they've been involved in HPC, and a, a one-line description of their role as a sysadmin or a software engineer or a team leader or whatever it is. So Samantha, if you want to start. Uh, so I'm Samantha Krupsbach. Um, I've been in HPC four and a half years. I hit my five year in June. Um, I work at ExxonMobil, and I am my title is HPC engineer. My background is in software engineering. So my name is Ron Barbosa. I joined Tech five years ago. Um, okay. Parallel programming was always my background, um, but directly HPC uh, as soon as I joined Tech. My name is Bosun Du. I have been working in BPHPC for five and a half years. My title is basically computational scientist slash performance engineer. Uh, my name is Liu Wang. I'm a software architect in Halliburton. I was Halliburton for about four years. I've been as a software developer for more than 13 years. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, my name is Patrick Blanchard. I'm a sysadmin uh, for Chevron, and I've been there for about a year. And my uh, background is in computer science. OK, so you see we have a very wide range from 13, 14 years to one year. People have been on panels. People are used to come from HVC centers and people from um, the oil companies and so on. So you have a bit of diversity. And it's deliberately done this way so that we have this fresh perspective. So let's see how we get on with some, some real traditional HPC questions. Um, so we'll do, a, we'll do a traditional panel question. So over the next few years, what do you think are the biggest challenges for HPC for the oil and gas sector? And Bosun, I'm going to start with you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I would personally say that it might be pretty hard for us to uh, recruit and keep the most talented people in the HPC teams uh, across the oil and gas industries. Uh, part of the reason is so many companies has been trying to hire the HPC experts, including the cloud companies, computer companies, as well as the DOE labs. But the HPC experts pool or the candidates pool is actually pretty small. So we need to think hard of how we can attract and keep those experts in the oil and gas industry. Thank okay. you. Zhao? Well, I'm not specifically from the oil and gas, so I'm going to put it more on the CS question background. So one of the biggest key challenges, and it was mentioned um, yesterday in one of the panels, is our data gathering tools are actually growing. Uh, the amount of data that we're processing and the amount of data that we're bringing in are actually um, going beyond what we are capable to do right now. So things like uh, edge computing and so forth will come, come up as uh, tools and we'll need to find a way to deal with that. Okay, Samantha? 
I would probably have to say scaling, um, simply because uh, the data that we're gathering is not getting any smaller. And so we still, so a lot of the optimizations and the algorithms that we've come up with, uh, they all have limits on how far they can scale, be it in uh, how much data they can handle or how far, how many nodes they can scale out to. And as things are getting bigger, we're going to have to address that. I mean, that's part of what the Exascale computing project's working on. So I don't think that's going to go away after Exascale. It's not like we're going to stop there. Okay. Who? Um, I'll say people and in business. Um, for people, I think, especially for oil and gas industry, it's kind of hard to keep the young generation. <coughs> so we have to have the pipeline build up, uh, at, at least attract the young kids into the oil and gas industry. And another is business. Um, it's always as me as a more work on the technology side. So it's it's kind of sometimes so hard to work align with business requirement, business needs. Kind of to have to trans take with different had to talk with business terminology so that business people can understand our technology requirements. Kind of what's what is in the for example in the academic area what they're already ahead of is how we can bring out all that technology from the academic area into the industry. Yeah. Patrick? So uh, from my perspective, I'm kind of thinking maybe funding might be an issue at some point in the oil and gas industry with um, price, fluctuation, price fluctuations of the um, price of gas. Um, I'm not sure. Um, since I've never really been in a, in a really bad uh, time, in the uh, gas industry or a really good time. So I guess it's, <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess it kind of, uh, I'll just have to see what the future holds. I, I like that answer actually. I think it, um, people talking about the money and the funding and the business side of HPC, we sometimes tend to forget that in this audience. We tend to be a very technology and technical focused conversation. The money matters very much so, otherwise the rest of it wouldn't happen. Um, Okay, let's move onwards a bit. And I think just a fair warning for the people in the audience who think this is a listening only mode. Anybody who's seen me moderate a panel before knows that I sometimes call on audience members to answer the panel questions as much as I ask the people up here. So anybody who's thinking of snoozing off, just be careful. And I don't have to know you either. It may be like you know the person in the yellow top, for example. So, um, so one of the things we have in HPC at the moment is um, we have a lot of different choices in the processor space. Um, there are a lot of different processor options available. There are more coming through from ARM and so on. So we have Xeon, we have Epic, we have Thunder X series, we have Power from IBM, we have the different GPU options and so on. Um, the question to think about here is, how much of this choice is good? How much, is, how much do we need to create competition in the ecosystem? And how much is just too much choice because it makes the cost and complexity of our decision-making processes too expensive and because it makes it difficult um, to have a sustainable one in the market. In other words, the risk of betting on the wrong horse is too high. So how much is too much and how much is enough for competition? And we're going to start at this end, um, Patrick. Um, I'm going to be honest, I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> well done, thank you. <laughs> so I, I, one of the things I told the panel before we start is don't be afraid to say, I don't know, I'm not able to answer that. And it's one of the things that when we have... Um, the more mature members sitting on the panel up here, nobody will ever admit to not being able to answer a question. Everybody will try and answer everything. Even if they don't have a clue what they're talking about, they'll get their time out. <laughs> and so I said, it's perfectly OK to say, I don't know. Um, Lou. Um, to be honest, I don't have the answer either. But um, if I said too much, because I'm a software developer, pretty much. So uh, with nowadays, like open source community kind of kind of emerging a lot is uh, bring us a lot of opportunity chances to get all kinds of information, but sometimes too much information. So you have to um, quickly filter so many things and make a decision making kind of, you have your metrics build up. Uh, like for example, our company internally, we do have process kind of optimize those kind of thing, but still it's too much information. It's like your social media. How, ma how, ma how many, um, hours you spend on your cell phone with Facebook, tweets, and how many real information you get from it, right? So it's kind of similar situation right now we have for all kinds of open source communities. For also, like when you uh, <clears throat> merge all this uh, 
information, software package, hardware, support everything into your software, have you really go through every single um, checkpoint, right? Uh, are they have the good enough support? Uh, what are uh, one year, three year, whatever long term roadmap? Do you have that in your vision? Kind of you have to all consider all kinds of those things into your um, project plan, everything. So we as oil and gas industry are HPC consumers. So I think from our standpoint, uh, actually the more computation, the market will be better. So I personally feel sorry to the vendors by saying that, but it does give us better price performance. But on the other hand, if we have too many options, we may have a hard time, as Andy mentioned, that how we prepare ourselves for those many options. So in that sense, I think it's good to have a set of rules or like open standards that everyone can follow. All the vendors can have support for that. So we know where we are going and we know we should use and we should do. Thank you. Ciao. Well. Uh, before joining tech, I actually came from industry, um, and planning a new system is something that is extremely complex, and betting on the wrong horse is always a problem. Choosing the right technology is always a problem. Um, having said that, having a very active and fruitful market with the type of vendors that we have, actually, as um, Ju said, um, it does offer better performance per flop. Uh, per, per, per price. So that, that's always a good thing. Um, it does point, uh, gives us a challenge of how do we address that diversity, but I don't think that the solution is on the hardware. The solution is actually on the software side. Uh, we need to find better ways of developing software in such a way that we can actually have performance portability instead of uh, using the whole model of I'll, I'll write a really specific application for this particular hardware um, and then I'll hopefully it will perform well in a different one. So we, we need to change that strategy. It's more on the software side than on the vendor side. The more choice, the better. And there's some really interesting challenges that we need to overcome. The memory uh, latency is one of the problems. It's one of our biggest problems right now. It's what the bottleneck of computing is uh, at this point. Uh, the energy uh, per flop is also another concern that we need to address. And the more vendors, the more solutions, the better. Um, so I, I would say that uh, competition is good. It forces companies to, uh, it challenges companies to uh, push for the, the leading edge of innovation and it, it challenge ev challenges everybody to be better. Um, uh, so I would say competition is good. However, as a software developer, I will say, I want a silver bullet for a compiler, guys. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> going from one platform to another, uh, another hard going from one hardware ar architecture to another hardware architecture, why do I have to come back in and switch compilers? Because we've, we've had problems with compilers in the past. This is not the 1980s. Why can we get compilers to segfault? Why can we get compilers to get stuck in infinite loops? Um, so we, we've definitely had challenges when it comes to experimenting with different compilers that come with the chips that, from those vendors. Um, and that's frustrating to me as a software developer because there's also problems with floating point reproducibility. So it is hard for me, as a computer scientist, to go to an end user who is a physicist and tell them, these two numbers aren't actually the same, but they're the same. I'm telling you they're the same. I mean, they're, all, they're off by just the little tiniest bit, but that doesn't matter. Uh, to, to them, it matters. And so having to do that business justification every single time we change which compiler, or uh, not just the compiler, but the, uh, the chips underneath, Every time that we change something in the ecosystem somewhere, we have that problem. So I guess that's my two cents. OK, cool. So we've, we've heard, um, uh, Jan said, we've, over the last few years, we've had people coming in from the Exascale program to talk about um, the, the, the progress in the DOE towards Exascale, and indeed other agencies and so on, um, into this conference. The question to the panel, um, 
to what extent does the DOE Exascale program affect your day-to-day -day role now? How does it help you, or is it an irrelevance that's further out? Um, how does it help you? How does it affect you? Um, Boson. Um, it used to be pretty far from me, uh, say a few years ago when the DOE Labs just started the e ECP effort. But um, as time goes along, we see more and more technologies coming out of the ECP effort. And I mean, the picture becomes more and more clear. And we realize that the next generation computing architectures will be different from what we are doing today. And everybody is saying we are going more memory hierarchies and we may go to some sort of accelerator in one way or another. I mean, that, that's not what we are used to do like in previous years. So we know we have to do something about it. We cannot just wait and when the time gets here and we just hit the wall. We cannot wait for that. So my role at BP has been changed a bit towards that direction. So I've been leading our efforts to prepare ourselves for the next generation computing architecture. And we, we've been trying to follow and learn from the DOE labs, try to be aligned with their ECP effort for the access to computing. Well, for me, it changed a lot. Um, tech, above all, is a research center. Um, and right now, so my, my role at tech is scale of visualization technologies. My smaller taste of the set is one billion triangles. So one trillion triangles, US. Um, sorry, I'm European. Uh, uh, so I'm talking about data sets that scale beyond what a GPU can do today, what a single host machine can do today. I'm always thinking what, what will be the, the next data set for in a couple of years. So that's the type of technology that I'm working at and researching it. So for me, it changed a lot um, in that sense. And we need different strategies for that. So Exxon Mobil historically has, so while we have a world-class supercomputer, we've purchased our supercomputers to be fit for purpose and to meet our business needs. Um, so while indirectly, we'll benefit from the Exascale computing project as a whole, as it benefits the whole industry. Um, but we will reach Exascale at ExxonMobil when our business needs push us to Exascale. So, uh, and we'll follow in the footsteps of all the trailblazers who are working on the project. Um, but as far as directly affecting our work, there's nothing directly. Okay. Um, so for our team, to be honest, we don't really have a direct connection with DOE Lab, um, because most of our work are support field operations. Uh, we, but we do, like for the last couple of years, we work on the uh, one of the DAS project. We utilize the GPU uh, <clears throat> processing to support our really, really high data rate, um, data acquisition, and also on the fly, real time GPU processing. Uh, we're talking about like 1.6 gig, uh, 1.6 gig uh, bits per second data acquisition rate. So it's pretty, pretty fast and pretty large. Um, so um, I said for now we don't have direct connection, but doesn't mean in the future we will not. We will not. Yeah. I think I kind of fall in the same um, situation where if if a business needs arise, we'll. we'll We'll kind of work towards that. I haven't heard um, much about Exascale um, in my daily work, and um, I haven't heard too many coworkers talking about it. So I, I think it'll, it'll probably it'll probably be there in the future, but not for, for right now. Okay, good. So I also warned the panel members that whilst they had seen a set of questions in advance, I reserved the right to ask ones they've never seen before, and this is one of those. So get your heart rates up. Um, um, one of the things that oil and gas is, is uh, like many industry sectors, people see HPC as a competitive asset, and that means that some organizations are very secretive and very protective about what they're doing about HPC. Um, others are far more open. 
and it's, 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 it's diverse. There's some people see the advantages in being open and engaging with the community and telling the community what they're doing and the size of the systems and so on. Other HPC, other oil companies, sorry, are very closed about what they're doing. We don't even talk about the architecture they've got, never mind the size and so on. And so the question then for the panel, which is really a harsh one for a, a, an early career panel, is what are the advantages and disadvantages of the secrecy? Where does it give you a competitive advantage and where, you know, where, where do you think it doesn't help you to be secret about it? And just to give them a little bit of a breathing space because it is an unfair question, um, I'm gonna pick on somebody from the audience to give a very quick answer on that, what they think the pros and cons of secrecy are. And Addison, you're up. Thanks, Andy. Am I waiting for a microphone or am I just- Go for it. Out? I can get you a microphone. Just a short one while they're thinking. Myself 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny, this actually just came up in a different industry, and I won't say which, but someone put out a, a public large-scale supercomputer in a particular industry, and, uh, and definitely it sent their competitors scurrying, including to us as professional analysts in this space, to analyze what do you think they're doing? Do we need to be doing the same thing? Um, so just the, the, the fact that it's out there and someone knows that you have that asset, it can definitely get the arms race going in order to say, all right, well, what, sh what should we be doing? That said, I mean, even within oil and gas up here, you've got kind of the range up there. BP has always been a little more open about what their plans are, and ExxonMobil is one of the more secretive ones, and Chevron's kind of in the middle. No, I'm serious. This me as an analyst, we're professional data gatherers here, and, and you know we ask these questions, and we know how open and closed people are. I don't know that it's ever put BP at any kind of strategic disadvantage to be relatively more open about what assets they have, and in, in particular, it can serve as a benefit because because it allows them to advertise to potential scientists who are on an early career panel and say, by the way, in order to do your work, we've got access to all of these resources. Now, ExxonMobil, Chevron, they've got these resources too, but in terms of just a, a public representation of what kind of assets are out there, put the flag in the ground and say, yeah, it's our intention to be world leaders and, and here's where we make that claim. So I, me, I would lean toward being a little more open, but you know, I understand the reticence of you know wanting to say, oh, hey, we don't want to just give away the give give away all the secrets. Okay, good. You've, you've given them good time to think. <laughs> <laughs> that was the goal, right? You're giving them some nuggets to think on. Um, <laughs> he gave me the sign. He yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll be much meaner to him than I will be to you guys. So, go, Samantha. My manager just walked in the room, so I'm going to plead the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> no, but really. No, but really. So I guess we have gotten the opportunity to be a little more transparent, and I would refer you all to the talk that uh, Mike did. Another call out for you, Mike. Um, that he did yesterday morning about our new data center project. Um, we are trying to be a, a little more open about what we're doing in the HPC space. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not, before you go on, so what do you think is the advantages of being secretive? I would say I'm a grunt and I don't know. <laughs> okay, good. My manager's sitting right over there if you want to talk to him. Ciao, <laughs> come. Will he fill out a survey for me? I don't know. Why don't you ask him? Go on. Um, well, Addison could do a sales pitch later. Go on, Joe. <laughs> it's, uh, I should decline to, 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 to answer this one, but anyway. Um, I understand the part of being secretive about what is the core business uh, and what is the essential data and data privacy and so forth. Um, I actually come my previous field was, was finance, so um, on that specific regard. So I, I, I get that, where, where data is actually gold. Um, since we are in oil and gas, it's actually much, much more profitable than, than oil and gas, to be honest. Um, so I get that. On the rest, I'm, I, I come from, right now I'm in an open community everything that we do is public, basically. And since I work for the state, even worse, everything is absolutely public. Um, 
so I'm more towards uh, being open source. But I do do understand where, from a financial point of view, where where data, especially those big data sets that are collected, are need to be kept secret and so forth. Okay, both. I would think most companies um, think their secretive IP as advantages compared to their competitors. And I think that's actually part of the competition, which is good for the market. So we allow the companies to keep their technologies, especially the cutting edge technologies as secret, so they can have motivation to advance in the technology area. And that's pretty much why the patent office are there for. And I think this is true across industries. And that's how the market works. And on the other hand, we, I, I do think that we need more collaborations. As I mentioned before, we, maybe we do not have to share everything we have, but at least we can have like an open standard, a set of rules. For example, for the oil and the gas industries, if everyone can have seismic data in the same data format, I believe that will make everyone's life easier. Uh, Luke? Um, can you repeat the question? I think I didn't already quite catch the question. So the question is, what are the advantages and disadvantages of keeping secret what you're doing in HPC? So things like the size of your system and the architecture you're using and so on. Mm. Okay, because um, um, from a software point of view, um, I would like nothing to keep a secret. Because <laughs> uh, I don't know, I, I know the guy talked about the patents, uh, but it's very extremely difficult for software to file patents, right? So, because, um, we would like to share stuff by nature of software. We would like to share all the resources, all the techniques we are using. So I would say the advantage is share, share the techniques. Uh, the disadvantage, um, I don't know. Um, have, have really not really processed my thoughts. Okay, sure. Oh, yeah. Patrick? Uh, so ever since I started uh, programming in school um, and kind of being involved, I guess, in the Linux community as far as like just using it. Uh, I've been a pretty big supporter of like open source software. Um, I understand why companies uh, would want to keep secrets. I, I think I think that's fine as long as there's some open community that's still out there publishing best practices and, and kind of innovating um, for everyone to see. Okay. Um, does anybody in the audience want to comment on that? Any volunteers? Uh, the uh, chap in the orange shirt. Yeah, uh, so I think there's Hold on. Wait for the microphone. I think there's often confusion about what is an actual valuable secret inside the company and what's not. And so it's different for the super majors where we're, our HPC may not directly be tied to revenue, and so our algorithms aren't necessarily connectly to, or directly connected to revenue like it may be with a service processor. So I think in our space, I mean, it's generally better to be open, to kind of share and, and build up the momentum in the industry, and I think that's what the basis of this workshop started under that premise that we get together and we can kind of openly share and move things forward and innovate. Sarah, I saw you smiling at that. Do you want to make a comment on that from the service provider point of view? There's a mi microphone on its way to you now. I was about to say something about the demographics, and I think it, you know, the oil and gas industry owns a lot of very cool systems, so why wouldn't they? be out there using it for recruitment and sort of changing a bit the face of an aging, somewhat boring, you know, black and environmentally unfriendly industry. I think that's the, the silver lining that I see. So I would sort of, you know, 
push everyone to say, use this and, and show how high tech we are, because there's some amazing science, amazing computer science that are, that are happening on these systems. And we should be proud and we should be open about that. And then you can keep your business secrets for yourself, but to sort of use that and leverage that to renew the industry, I think would be, would be smart. Okay. All right, let's move on a little bit. Um, so one of the questions I have seen before, um, and I don't know whether they've discussed this with their bosses or not, but the question I asked them was, if you were the head of HPC at your organization instead of somebody else, what would you change? And perhaps to paraphrase that, it's a good way of saying, what are we oldies missing because we've been doing this for too long? So, um, Samantha, you get to go first. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that Charlie's the head of our HPC anymore. It's reorged. I think it's Mike now. <laughs> um, I would like more of a focus on what the software can deliver in terms of optimizations. Um, that might be a biased opinion because I'm a software engineer. Um, but we've always sort of had this attitude that oh, well, I can get free performance by just buying better CPUs. Um, when, if your code doesn't run super well on the previous generation of CPUs, you're not getting everything that you can out of the next generation of CPUs. So uh, I would like more of a focus on that. Um, I also understand business pressures say, uh, commercialize more uh, research and make these workflows available to our community. Um, I almost want a little more focus on improving what we have instead of doing the uh, next latest and greatest, so. You just made all the hardware vendors unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, and then just to mix things up a little bit, we're gonna go out of order, so Patrick, down to you. So I've only been with my uh, organization for a year and I haven't really seen anything yet that I think can change or that I would know that needs to change. So I, I don't think I'm kind of in a position to really make, make a good, I guess, answer for that question. Is, so let me put it a slightly different way for you then. Is there anything that you did or you saw in your university, because you're, you're the freshest out of university of every on the panel, that you see is just, you haven't heard of in this industry yet that you think we should be listening to? Um, you mean if I heard anything in university that we should bring into? In, into real, yeah, exactly. I, no, I can't say I have. Okay. I, I think uh, when I first came, I, I didn't choose to come into HPC. I just kind of got lucky enough to get put into it. So I guess I wasn't, I, I, I wasn't kind of in tune with a lot of the, um, a lot of the HPC culture that was happening like at the same time when I was in university. Okay, sure. Blue? Since my manager is sitting over there, so I hope she can hear what I say. Okay, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I have, initially I have two thoughts, right? So it's just based on what our team operates. Uh, I do see that if, if this dream comes true, right? Uh, I would like to have more connection to academia, uh, like in, with universities, labs, national labs has more, um, you know, communication with them and see what's going on. Even it's way ahead of our real life, but it eventually, right, in the future, we can incorporate little by little. Uh, another thing is kind of related to that, right? So like, um, every year we do have an intern, intern position, so we can have a kind of opportunity to try it out a little bit here and there, but I do like if we can have at least allocate a small budget every year for our research. That would be really nice. Um, two purpose, right? So it can motivate our team members because everyone like, would like to try something new other than do the daily job over and over again, right? Second of all, it's, it's not just a pet project and we do something to throw it away, right? So we'll definitely can, kind of have the um, business value with it kind of help us in the, in the future, so. Sure. Yeah. Awesome. My answer to this question is similar to Samantha's answer. Um, I wish we could have more performance engineers in our team, but actually we have been trying pretty hard to do that. And as I mentioned before, it's pretty hard to hire qualified performance engineers in the recent years. It has been like this for quite a while. 
So we are still working hard on that. But I do wish that we have been successfully hiring more performance engineers into the team. Okay, Jiao. Uh, well, my director is here and one of the LT teams is here, so I need to be careful. Uh, <laughs> and I think my annual review is coming up. Anyway. Um, no, but, but to be honest, um, I, I don't know if I would change anything at, uh, at the center of them. And uh, once again, I'm, I'm research. Um, and both my director and my leadership team have always found me the best and biggest toys to play with, which makes me a lot happy. Um, I always have something new to play with, with every couple of months. Um, and even the environment itself is extremely stimulating uh, on itself. We have a huge uh, interdisciplinary among the groups of it. Um, so we're always talking to each other and coming up with new crazy ideas. So for me to say that I would change anything, it would be extremely hard. Okay. So there's been a lot of bosses put on the spot here. Um, and I think it's only fair to reflect that on myself and Rob is standing in the corner. So Reed, what do we need to do differently? <laughs> So Reed works for my team. Perhaps consider more internship positions, uh, training more people, uh, because HPC is pretty niche. I mean, there's a lot of people in this room that know it really well, but there's a lot of people in CS who've never touched the kind of work that we do here. Uh, and that would create more talent for the talent pool. Uh, people have got to start somewhere. Okay. Thank you. Oh, we have, we have somebody here who wants to make a comment, question? Yeah, just a comment. Sure. So this may not be true for uh, the oil and gas space, but in general for uh, HPC codes, I've noticed that software engineering practices are pretty weak uh, right from the beginning. So uh, I think companies or even the software developers should enforce software engineering best practices like documentation and uh, because the codes are hard enough to understand and work with because these are massive uh, codes in most cases. So the uh, path to begin understanding it will be much easier with uh, better software engineering practices throughout the industry. Yeah, I would like to comment on that. Um, so it's always balancing. Yeah, I understand the documentation is very critical, but however, you do not want to over-document. Any software know that when you write the comments and you update your code, you forget to update your comments. Then you, you don't understand what comments mean here, right? So. I, I totally agree with you. We do need a standard process, best of the practice, but it's not necessarily just documentation. It has to be more systematic way, right? So you can in, um, adopt a different methodologies such as scrums, agile, right? Whatever makes best for you, right? And also um, unit testing, integration testing, all those things are very critical too. It's not just for code quality. It's also for good design too. Okay. Cool. Have a we have question a over here. Comment in the back corner. Question. question. So my question is, um, I'm curious about how the majority sees the collaboration of industry with academia, because I come from academia and uh, we've noticed that most of the times people wish to do things and we have the technology or the knowledge or whatever, but we don't have the data. And sometimes when we contact people from industry, uh, they, they don't really want to share their data. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is uh, how much credibility can we bring by playing around with synthetic data or data just generated for, for us to do something, but not the real field data. And uh, this is uh, maybe in relation more to the oil and gas, because we have co collaboration with the oil and gas companies. Okay, that, that's a great question. Boson. Um, 
I'm not quite on the point to comment about the seismic data because I'm mostly a software developer. I'm not a geophysicist. But what I heard of is usually if it's field data, I don't think that something companies can share a lot with others. But for some of the synthetic data, what I heard is uh, people are willing to share with, say, partners or academia uh, to see how different algorithms or different applications can produce maybe better or um, some new capabilities from their work. I mean, I, I always think at least BP is willing to do that for the synthetic data part. Uh, as for the software part, actually, um, again, there are IP issues. I don't think most companies can share their production code with others. But um, for companies like BP, we are willing to share, say, mini apps or um, performance kernels from our, uh, like, can represent the performance behavior of our production applications. We, we are willing to share those things with either DOE labs or academia or even other uh, company partners. We can collaborate and work together to see how we can achieve better performance for our applications. Okay, thank you. Samantha, Charlie and Mike have both walked out, so maybe you feel a little freer to comment now. <laughs> uh, oh, wait, Jonathan's still here, dang it. Um, and so as far as how our researchers work, they also develop all of their, their a lot of their research on synthetic workflows as well. Um, so I wouldn't say there's too much of a disjoint with uh, academia and uh, commercial research working on uh, synthetic data. And I mean, the data sets that we work on are like the, the SEAM data set, which is a publicly available synthetic data set. Um, as far as, I mean, I think Bozen mostly hit it, uh, did I say your name right? Okay, uh, hit it on the head when he pointed out, I mean, a lot of the data that we have is, we've purchased the data and it's proprietary data and we may or may not be able to share it because of certain licensing issues around owning the data. Um, so that's probably the largest hiccup that we would run into as far as sharing and collaborating with an industry production data set, so. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on to what I think is the last plan question. Um, so we've had big data, we've had cloud computing, we've had machine learning, we've had green computing, we've had AI, we've had quantum computing. Um, what is the next hype that we're going to see in the HPC world? So we're going to be talking about next year or the year after is the hype thing in HPC. You'll stun silence for a few minutes. Jao, you didn't answer that last question, so you get to go first on this one. Oh, that's so much fun. Um, uh, if, if I had a crystal ball, um, I would be extremely rich. But anyway, um, so that there's actually something that was mentioned um, twice that I can recall uh, uh, during the conference, uh, which is neuromorphic computing. Um, it's actually something that it's still in research phase. It's interesting that it's getting to industry. Uh, that fast. That's the first time that I recall something that goes from research to industry this fast and at this stage. But it's something that it's actually interesting, when, especially when you couple it with, uh, with neural networks uh, and machine learning. Uh, it's something that will definitely produce results, I think, faster than quantum computing uh, will ever come to market. Um, and it will change a lot of what we do. Uh, it will change the way that we perceive discrete computing. Um, it has the potential to break some of the bottlenecks of the von Neumann model that we traditionally use on, on discrete computing. Um, it has, does have the potential to accelerate a lot of uh, our machine learning algorithms. Uh, it does consume way less power than, than discrete computing does right now. Um, it will have a lot of potential to, to resolve things like scheduling and algorithm scheduling, monitoring, even the discrete computing. So there, there's a lot of potential there that I can see. So that's something that I would hope would come to market. Okay, Lou? Yeah, I was quickly search all the buzzword in my mind. <laughs> What's pop up first? Um, 
so at least uh, for for our uh, company and teams, we we'll talk about lots about digital twin and blockchain. Um, especially, we we'll work a lot with field data. So um, once the data been generated, we never really have a good mechanism to. Uh, unique, you uniquely identify every single data set on um, recording every transaction, every single history associated with this data set, what's going on, what happens. Um, think about it like money, right? When you um, uh, <clears throat> um, trans transaction with money, so you actually kind of recording every single you know, transaction point, but we don't do that for the data. So it's kind of a similar concept. Um, I, can, I do can see that uh, if we can utilize that kind of technology can help us uh, for us, both on the um, machine learning, digital, um, deep learning also, because we try to understand how um, the data set being acquired, every single um, processing steps associated with the data, how the people manipulate the data, every single uh, snapshot, right? Um, but again, right, so it's really just quick, quick, dirty answer from my, my mind right now, so it may not be deeply processed at all. Okay, Samantha? I don't know, that was an awfully long list. Why don't we start hyphenating them? <laughs> uh, but uh, to be entirely honest, I mean, most of my day-to-day, I'm mostly focused on solving the, the problems in the day to day, so I honestly can't say that I really know what the next hype is going hype is going to be. So. Does that uh, translate as you don't care what the next hype is going to be? <laughs> Exxon Mobil always chooses a fit for purpose solution. <laughs> <laughs> uh, person, <laughs> follow that. <laughs> um. So among the terms you threw out in the questions, yeah. uh, actually, for example, for quantum computing is already like decades away. People say it's like 10 to 100 years away. So by answering this question, I feel like I'm answering something 100 years away or more. So I, I don't think I can really predict anything, but if you really want me to make a wild guess and related to HPC and energy industry, I may think of something like nuclear fusion, controlled nuclear fusion, because um, people consider that as um, like clean energy, and it's something we can pretty much use forever. So I, I don't know how achievable that is or how soon that will become feasible. Um, I mean, from the presentation yesterday, um, from that life, he showed the shell sky scenario. And I saw on the picture that even in 2070, I don't really see a like, big percentage of nuclear energy source on the graph. So I, I, honestly, I don't know how soon this can happen, but this is just my wild guess. OK, sure. Patrick. So I can't um, answer for anything specifically, but I think one of the um, more interesting things I've, I've kind of noticed uh, and has been mentioned here uh, during the conference was that, uh, especially with machine learning, some of these algorithms that are being used have already been studied um, in the in the 80s and 90s and they were kind of not seen as I guess useful as they were thought of and then as uh, computational power um, increased they, 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 they started to become more and more useful so I think maybe a, an origin point for something that might be hyped in the future would be something that might be that might have been already studied but not seen as like feasible or might be being studied now and not seen as feasible. Yeah, good point, I like that. Um, that brings us to the end, we've run out of time. So um, first of all, please thank the panel members.